Good afternoon. My name is Kyle Roberts, and I'm the Associate Director of Library and Museum Programming at the American Philosophical Society. Welcome to today's David Center for the American Revolution virtual discussion with Dr. Jason Sharples on the world that fear made, slave revolts and conspiracy scares in early America. I'm glad that so many of you have been able to join us today. The American Philosophical Society re resides in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. The APS acknowledges with respect their continued presence and perseverance and expresses its sincere thanks for the past and ongoing generosity of numerous indigenous communities and individuals who've offered their guidance, their expertise, and opportunities for collaboration. For those of you joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded in, by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. The society is a catalyst for the discovery of new knowledge. Election to membership honors those who have made exceptionally significant contributions to science, the arts and humanities, and public life. The society promotes research by providing over $1 million in research grants a year, primarily to younger scholars who need the support the most. Our library, museum, collections, and research centers serve visitors and scholars from around the globe. Please check out our website, amphilsoc.org, to learn more about what we do and for news of forthcoming events. We're using Zoom webinar today, so not to worry, you have all been muted. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom center of your navigation bar. You might want to just take a second now and locate it. It should be right down there. You can type a question for Jason at any time during the talk today. We're going to have about 10 to 15 minutes uh, for discussion at the end of the panel today for, as I said, questions with our speaker. We're also very happy to offer closed captioning for today's virtual discussion. If you'd like to use it during the panel, go ahead and look at the bottom navigation bar and see the little CC box. Click that uh, and it will give you access uh, to the closed captioning, which will be done live uh, throughout the program. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Jason Sharples is an associate professor of history at Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton, Florida. He teaches courses on colonial America, the American Revolution, comparative slavery and abolition in the Americas, and conspiracy theories in the United States. His research has brought him to archives in the Caribbean, Europe, and around the United States. And among those he very proudly notes was the David Library of the American Revolution, which of course is now the David Center at the American Philosophical Society. The World That Fear Made, Slave Revolts and Conspiracy Scares in Early America appeared from the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2020. I'm gonna go ahead and put a link uh, when, we, when the talk starts uh, in the chat box. We also are very happy to be able to extend a 20% discount on the book. Um, the discount code is PP20, uh, and I will also make sure that that gets into the chat. So with that, let me, uh, let me stop talking. I'm gonna bring up Jason uh, to give us his talk today. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Kyle. Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to um, be talking to you today because I've enjoyed these remote seminars. I'm down in Florida, and so I'm not able to participate in the APS programming as much as I'd like. And uh, one of the silver linings um, of uh, our times is that I've been doing a lot more Philadelphia-centered events from Boca Raton. Um, the other great pleasure here is that um, I um, completed some of this research at the David Library at Washington Crossing and found that collection to be amazing to burrow myself into. All that I needed was right there on the shelves into the microfilms um, and uh, worked its way into chapter six of the book. Um, and uh, it, it's just so such a pleasure to learn that the David Library's collections are being um, um, taken care of by the APS now and that um, this great community of scholars is um, uh, still forming around this amazing collection. All right, I'm gonna share my, um, a PowerPoint presentation with you. And uh, so you should be seeing a map right now of South Carolina, a little, uh, it's a map from the period. And um, I'm starting here because I wanna begin with a puzzle. Um, the mystery comes from colonial South Carolina in the middle of the 1700s when it was still part of the British Empire. This was rice growing country where white colonists purchased large numbers of people from Africa as if they were property. So many in fact that black people formed a majority in the region at the time. 
Now, the puzzle is a comparison between two events that occurred here. One was a spontaneous uprising, another a planned insurrection. These occurred roughly 10 years apart, and each one involved more than 100 enslaved people. In the first, in September 1739, a core group of about 20 people near Stono River who were desperate to free, to free themselves broke into a store and seized weapons and killed two white storekeepers. They chose not to march 10 miles north to strike at the heart of the regime in Charleston, where the slumbering townspeople would have made pretty easy targets in the middle of the night. Instead, they tried to flee almost 300 miles south to St. Augustine in Spanish Florida. And that's because the Spanish empire had a policy that welcomed fugitive slaves from the British empire as refugees, as long as they converted to Catholicism. This was a way that many fugitives from South Carolina secured not just their personal autonomy by fleeing, but their legal freedom by joining a rival empire. As the group from the Stono River uh, advanced southward along the road and raised a banner, they passed plantation labor camps where several hundred more people were also enslaved. As they went, about 80 of them um, took the risk of joining the band and accepting um, the exchange of freedom for the cost of severing ties with people they had known in South Carolina, in some cases their whole lives, or at least since they um, had arrived in America um, on slave ships. This insurrectionary force plundered some of the houses they passed and, and burned them as they left. They killed about two dozen white enslavers and spared the lives of others. They made it to the next river, but then they succumbed to the colony's militia in a battle in the open field um, because the militia had managed to muster itself. In South Carolina's largest rebellion before the chaos of the American Revolution, these insurgents rejected slavery through personal escape rather than general massacre in Charleston or political takeover of the colony. They rose up in arms, but their goal was to flee the colony rather than take it over. So the second event that I wanna to compare to this was 10 years later in January, 1749, and it was only 10 miles away. It was in Charleston. This uh, was a different group of enslaved people. They appeared in the highest court of the colony to confess their plans for insurrection. But as they described their intentions, they painted a planned, uh, a violent, a picture of planned violence that looked pretty different than the Stono Rebellion. Um, leading um, the confessions was a man named Agrippa, an enslaved boatman. He stood before the governor and six of the most powerful men in the colony and revealed that hundreds of enslaved people would rise at the end of the week. What I'm showing you here is a fair copy, a clean copy of the trial minutes, the, um, the, the transcript of what transpired in this investigation. And he has a detailed um, confession. The governor acted on this confession. He ordered costly countermeasures. He forced common white men to put down their work so they could mobilize as a policing force, a militia, to patrol by foot and horse and boat to try to prevent this possible insurrection from occurring. He also stopped all the harbor traffic. In Charleston, he stationed two Royal Navy vessels nearby. Normal business basically ground to a halt for two weeks based on this confession to a possible or rumored insurrection that might occur. But this uprising did not occur. Agrippa and six other enslaved informants only described the plan, which they called at the time a conspiracy or a plot. Uh, that was the parlance of the time that enslavers used and um, that their informants also used. It was really a plan for insurrection when they talk about a conspiracy or a plot. They, in their confessions, they implicated 104 enslaved people and 13 white laborers in joining this. Um, they said that there were two white men who were supposedly connected to the Spanish, who had come into society as transients and seemed to be uh, the ones who proposed the plot and organized it for the enslaved people. Now this fit with the white society's incorrect assumption that enslaved people supposedly could not organize themselves because 
they were supposedly natural followers who were incapable of having strategic vision. This was part of the myth that um, supposedly justified uh, white people commanding the labor of black people. The organizers appeared to initiate the conspirators by swearing them to secrecy with formal oaths, which created a network of confirmed conspirators that stretched um, all up and down the river and involved headmen, um, so um, some of the leaders of rural plantations um, who also recruited some of what they called the cleverest slaves in their employ. The informants insisted that this goal, that the goal of this um, uprising was going to be racial massacre, uh, or to put it um, the way they did, um, to kill the white people. They said that was the goal and that Charleston was the target where they could take advantage of a concentrated white population. The master stroke of the plot was, uh, and I'm gonna highlight it here on the confession, that was to set the town and powder magazine on fire and in the confusion that it caused to kill the white people. So to use the explosion at the powder magazine to draw white people into the streets uh, to fight the fire to, um, and they'd be, um, have just woken up so they would be very confused and then to use that moment to ambush them um, and then the insurgents would head out for freedom on the frontier this was the confession of what was planned so the puzzle is why was the stono rebellion of 1739 where they marched southward to spanish florida so different than the plan for the rebellion that informants warned about now in 1749 in the same place at roughly the same time. Well, the rest of the puzzle comes into view if we expand our vision to include the rest of the British colonies. I need to jump ahead to my map because I realized I put it in the wrong place. Um, so if we expand our vision beyond South Carolina and we look at the rest of the British colonies, which means we look at the Caribbean as well as North America, because we have to include um, the connections between those Caribbean colonies that had networks of trade and migration, including forced migration of slavery, um, that exchanged news and information. Those Caribbean colonies that were so valuable economically to the British Empire on the backs of slaves um, also were valuable in their relationship to the North American colonies that became part of the US. It was only in 1776 with the American Revolution that these two territories separated politically. So what I'm trying to show you here is not a comparison between the two regions um, as much as connections, that these were all part of the same framework. We include the wharves of New York City and Charleston and Bermuda and the rivers and fields of the Chesapeake Bay and the Carolinas and the sugarcane fields and cattle pens that smothered Barbados and the Leeward Islands uh, those little islands um, far to the east in the Caribbean and um, Jamaica too. So um, this is the framework that helps us understand this puzzle and unlock it. If we if we look at all of these events and what I'm showing you are similar, uh, um, the, the little um, icons are showing you conspiracy investigations and they're colored darker or lighter depending on if they're a major large ones or minor small ones. These were, um, so this is where Agrippa's confession is represented. It's one of those little icons um, near Charleston in the bubble off of Charleston, the coast of South Carolina there. Dozens of times enslaved informants confessed to these conspiracies or plots. That's what's represented here graphically. Um, dozens of times um, they said things that were strikingly similar to what Agrippa said in his revelations in Charleston. Lots of times they said that they would set diversionary fires and ambush the white people who rushed to extinguish them. In Barbados in 1692, for example, investigators believed that conspirators would have, quote, set the town on fire in several places to amuse the inhabitants, which means to distract them to amuse the inhabitants and lure them into a slaughter. In New York in 1741, there was a series of 13 fires that prompted investigators to announce that plotters had 
um, set those fires with the intent of ambushing, quote, the white people who came to extinguish them, to kill and destroy them. In Jamaica in 1744, there was another one where the conspirators planned to light fires in a town, it seemed, um, first at one end of it and then at the other, so that when people ran in confusion to the same, they were to be stabbed and destroyed. Um, in New York in 1775, this happened again. In 1822 in South Carolina, in a very famous affair, the Denmark Vesey affair, um, conspirators wanted uh, supposedly to quote, set the town on fire in different places. And as the whites came out, slay them. So that centerpiece of, 17, of the South Carolina plot of 1749 that Agrippa confessed to, to blow up that powder magazine and use the distraction to massacre the townspeople. It had more in common with these other revelations of intended violence than with how actual violence progressed in the example of the Stono Rebellion when people actually took up arms and what they actually did was follow the road away from Charleston and only burn the rural plantations after the fact, not to use them as decoy fires. That idea of an ambush at, um, that would occur at a diversionary fire, it was just one of several recurring features in conspiracy confessions that had more in common with Agrippa's confessions than with those Stono Rebellion actions. During other conspiracy scares, again, those are the things represented here by the flames. These are investigations, not actual um, outbreaks of violence by enslaved people at least. During these other scares, informants said that conspirators took direction from outside agitators like Catholic spies, which was another element of Agrippa's confession that an outsider came in to organize the slaves who supposedly couldn't do it themselves, that they swore oaths to each other to maintain their secrecy, um, supposedly witnessed by Agrippa's enslaver. Also that they circulated lists of conspirators um, so a graphic representation of this um, uh, comes from Barbados in 1692. This list of conspirators was actually appended to the report that the investigators made um, after they got confessions, coerced confessions through torture. Um, in terms of tactics, the con conspirators sometimes confessed that they timed the averted rebellion for holiday, such as Easter or St. Patrick's Day or Christmas and that they'd coordinate the uprising with the French, the Spanish, or Native American invaders. Often the initial informer claimed to alert the community within days of the planned insurrection. That's kind of what Agrippa did. I mean, it's something that's so dramatic. It sounds like it was ripped from a theater production of the time, um, that always the revelation came the day of the intended insurrection, that he says it, um, it'll happen tonight. He creates a sense of urgency in this. They described common goals across all of these examples. They um, said they wanted to massacre the white men, that they wanted to rape the white women, and above all, that they were aiming for a social inversion by which they'd take the names of leading planters and replace them, um, call each other by the names of their former enslavers, replace them at the heads of families, at the heads of estates or plantations, at the heads of government, and so this list that I'm showing you right now, um, it may be hard to see, to, uh, I'm not sure how large your screen is, but um, on the left side is the name of an enslaver who was in the militia. And on the right side is the name of a conspirator, an enslaved conspirator who is going to take his place and take his name and take his family and his estate. Um, so there's this kind of parallel shadow society that enslavers believed was going, was, um, going to be re replacing them um, if the insurrection broke out and was successful. Well, Agrippa's confession certainly had some connections to the Stono Rebellion. We also can't understand them unless we look at that larger framework of the other related but distinct um, phenomenon, the slave conspiracy scare. So the slave conspiracy scare is the subject of my book. And it's connected to rebellions that actually broke out when enslaved people actually took up arms. Um, but it's different. Um, it grew from different historical forces that generated a different set of effects on the world. 
these were events that were more about information and misinformation, um, at least um, as much as they were events about insurrection. So we can take our expanded geographic view and apply that kind of uh, Atlantic framework, as historians call it, to what actually happened in most revolts as a comparison. So instead of comparing just the two South Carolina events, let's compare all revolts that we know about where slaves took up arms and all investigations into alleged conspiracies where they said they were going to, but it never happened. You can take that broad comparison and we'll find that groups of rebels usually began um, their insurrections at one or two plantation labor camps, and they typically stayed limited in scope. An insurrection was a very dangerous proposition for whoever joined it. If the rebels didn't end up escaping at the end, they could expect extreme reprisals. Therefore, many hundreds of people who were enslaved in the immediate vicinity would not join. Those who did take up arms um, and those who drew larger numbers ex and who accepted that risk of joining an insurrection, um, they, they, were, um, they represented cases that occurred only really a handful of times in the data set. Their enlistment and violence usually spread in a viral fashion. They would go kind of from estate to estate or plantation to, to plantation recruiting some people there, not everyone necessarily, and, um, and, the, and the, the violence would spread kind of like fire maybe across the colony or, or like um, in a viral fashion. Now, there's not much evidence that these larger events that eventually became really big conflagrations, um, things like Tacky's Revolt in Jamaica or um, the Haitian revolutions, the, the, the rebellion that began the Haitian Revolution, there's not a lot of evidence that there was like a vast colony-wide clandestine network that was planning a simultaneous uprising in all places at once. These were much more um, kind of piecemeal things that grew um, and snowballed. Rebels also pursued different tactics and different goals than those professed by informants who are describing alleged conspiracies, they usually killed very few white people and rarely, rarely committed sexual violence, contrary to enslavers' expectations of massacre and rape. Generally, they prioritized plundering for provisions and escaping from the zone of colonization rather than going out of their way to murder extra white people or conquer colonial centers. That's because they didn't want to jeopardize their opportunity for individual success with complicated plans for overturning the social order. When they set fire to buildings, they did it to deny their, adver their adversaries shelter and to intimidate pursuers with billowing spectacles. There's little evidence that they initiated rebellions by setting diversionary fires to draw inhabitants out into an ambush. These limited conflicts were actually a the most sensible strategy for insurgents who found themselves in situations of extreme domination. They, um, these, con these smaller versions of the conflict allowed rebels to seek autonomy in regions that were inaccessible to their former oppressors, places like mountains or swamps or forests, um, or even Spanish settlements like St. Augustine in Spanish Florida. The Stono Rebellion was similar to most other rebellions with that limited initial participation that then spread virally and with that primary goal of escape rather than massacre, even if it didn't square with the confessions of Agrippa in 1749. Because the initial answer to our puzzle as to why these two events in South Carolina were so markedly different is that they were two distinct types of events. White enslavers at the time conflated them, seeing them as the same kind of threat. They conflated them from the beginning and that kind of filtered down to modern scholars who've tended to accept that flattened categorization of the events too. So if we think about conspiracy scares separately, we can um, see that these uh, during these investigations into possible plans for rebellion, enslavers forced informants to speculate about violence that might occur or that could have occurred. 
instead of describing something that actually did occur. Because remember, these did not break out into actual rebellion. These were just investigations. For white people in early America, the only significant difference between a conspiracy and a rebellion was the stage to which the insurgent activity developed. And that's part of what stoked their fear. There were so many of these investigations that they assumed that there was a great level of um, kind of vengeance uh, uh, attempted by enslaved people, uh, a, a great thirst for vengeance. In their minds, when enslaved people did take up arms in rebellion, magistrates um, kind of explained it as having originated as a conspiracy that they had failed to detect. There's another way to think about the difference between a rebellion and a conspiracy. And when the rebellion failed to engulf the whole colony, as with Stone, the Stono Rebellion, which did not engulf the whole colony, they expressed relief that somehow the original conspiracy misfired. And they kept the, they thought they kept dodging bullets with these investigations. But as my book explores, the investigations were almost like self-fulfilling prophecies where they, um, they wanted to look for the threat of insurgent violence. And so they found a scarier boogeyman um, than actually necessarily existed. I think this um, distinction between the two types of events is the beginning of our answer. But the rest of our answer has to do with recognizing the role of fear in all of this. And that slavery as a system was at its core, a system of fear. Now enslavers deliberately tried to command obedience from the Africans and African-Americans who they enslaved. Um, a major, so uh, a major apologist for slavery uh, whose work I'm showing you here, Brian Edwards, theorized in his 18th century book that fear, as he put it, fear was the only impulse to action to which an enslaved person could respond. The lash, I'll show you um, a, a picture of the lash. This, these are some, um, some disturbing images. I do want to um, warn you of the content note. Um, um, the, the, the whip or the lash was the most obvious instrument of attempted terror wielded by enslavers. Um, this was not meant to mechanically prod enslaved people. It was meant to inflict freshly stringing, uh, freshly stinging examples of what could happen to them if they displeased an enslaver. This was meant to terrorize the onlookers much more than it was necessarily to inflict pain on the person um, who was being punished. And slavers also terrorized women and men with rape and its lingering trauma. And they threatened them with the possibility of humiliation, confinement, reassignment to difficult labor. And they threatened to separate family members from each other by selling them away. This altogether, this was a system of torture. The torture was aimed at compelling labor and outward obedience outward signs of obedience, not necessarily inner submission, but um, some kind of um, outward action. In wielding these instruments of terror, enslavers deliberately exploited people's human instinct to avoid doing whatever might lead to pain or to loss. But in wielding terror and using torture, white people also inadvertently generated an unintended consequence, and that was their own fear of Black people. Um, before I explore that more, I, I want to point out that the government was also a perpetrator of another form of terror that enslaved people experienced. Enlightenment thinkers at the time theorized and generally agreed that terror could be used to maintain standing order, the, the, maintain, the standing social order. Enslaved people faced the possibility of painful death and mutilation at the hands of the state whenever it claimed to act for the public safety of white people by punishing black people. They experienced this as a compound fear because the public display of dismembered corpses had religious implications as Vincent Brown has shown. Um, they also continued to experience the terror long after these grisly spectacles vanished from sight because their daily travels carried them through a landscape of crossroads and market squares 
where punishments had occurred, as Marissa Fuentes, another author from Penn Press, has shown. I'm going to show you another um, another image of this um, terrorizing some of these technologies of terror. I guess we could call them um, bodies being hung up at crossroads. These were meant to terrorize the viewers. So I'm just warning. I'm about to show that. Oops. Um, like this. These were public displays meant to affect the living, to influence the actions of the living, um, to change their calculus for actions in the future. For example, after one uprising, an enslaver expressed the stomach turning hope that the grisly spectacle would quote, leave a terror on the minds of enslaved people, quote, for the future to prevent them from rising again. Enslaved people carried this accretion of violent experiences and traumatizing examples that enslavers and colonial governments deliberately de deployed to try to control them. And I'll add this uh, wasn't limited to the colonial period. This extended and um, was elaborated in the new United States and beyond. This violence and terror has led some scholars to see that the bodies of enslaved women and men were a site for political resistance against oppression. Um, so um, they look to the communities that people formed, to their survival, and acknowledge more and more that survival itself was the fundamental struggle. And that might help explain why people were less willing to take the risk of open rebellion. People suffered from scarcities. They um, deliberately um, Enslavers deliberately um, imposed scarcity on enslaved people as a way to control them, to um, extract wealth from them. People were living on the brink, and they were forced to compete with each other for limited resources. Um, the fear of punishment could, could make this worse. Um, so many people resorted to subtle forms of resistance that couldn't be easily ascribed to them, but that achieved human scale victories. They preserved something of their bodies for their own use by taking food, by feigning or exaggerating illness, by destroying equipment necessary for production, uh, by working less vigorously when they knew no one was looking. These were realistic ways for extremely vulnerable people to attempt to meet their basic needs and to cope with that pervasive pain and terror of enslavement. When possible, and now remember, we're talking about a system of slavery that imposed considerable restraints. Slaves asserted their personal control of their bodies as resources at the expense of enslavers through movement, adornment, enjoyment, depletion. This, there's a, a somewhat um, idealized depiction of this uh, in the slide right now of uh, enslaved people on Saturday nights and Sundays coming together at illicit social gatherings across plantation lines or at religious occasions where they, um, they weren't as um, happy as, as um, this image is trying to make them out to be, but this image does represent the kind of community that could form as people formed bonds and found they could discuss their shared plight with a few trusted souls and even develop support networks for the really tough times. Some fled their enslavers temporarily for days or weeks as a way to preserve their bodies or visit family members who were held in captivity somewhere else. This array of responses showed just how wrong enslavers were when they proclaimed that slaves somehow lacked the mental capacity to resist. Um, no, they were actually very smart about how to resist and preserve themselves. A small number of enslaved people who were driven to desperation took the most dangerous path. They rose in open rebellion against their oppressors um, and risked almost certain death. In the recorded history of slavery, which goes back to the ancient world, revolts have been awfully rare because there's not a clear exit strategy. So most rebels had, um, they followed the only exit strategy that, that seemed realistic when rising up in a violent rebellion. They took flight to the frontier, to mountains, um, to swamps, and they formed what were known as maroon communities. But this did not, uh, um, this was not an agreement with what white people were afraid of happening, of that takeover of society. 
what this did was it planted the seed of fear that white people realized that the slaves could do this. And white enslavers started to, to suspect that slaves had a desire for vengeance. In other words, white enslavers felt guilty. They knew what they were doing was wrong. When South Carolina's colonists tried to make sense of the Stono Rebellion in 1739, some presumed that it was for uh, um, revenge, they said, for particular severities that they um, had received from masters and overseers. Um, at another rebellion the, in Antigua, in the Caribbean, the colony's governor thought that the enslaver whom the rebels beheaded was probably, quote, guilty of some unwise act of severity or indignity. They assumed that this was retribution for poor treatment. They realized that at root, the cause of possible insurrection was the abuse that the enslavers were themselves perpetrating. There was a radical thinker at the end of the 1600s who tried to play on enslavers' fear of vengeance to advocate for better treatment of enslaved people. And he wrote an imagined dialogue in which in the voice of a slave, he noted that enslavers mistreated enslaved people with great tyranny, injustice, and cruel usages, including, quote, gratifying their raging lusts with the rape of our women. So the fictional slave cautioned the enslaver. Now, this is actually the radical writer putting these, um, using kind of ventriloquism, put this in the mouth of this fictional slave, but cautioning that this violence, quote, stirred up wrathful qualities in us. And um, he noted that enslaved people had already formed several horrid plots and conspiracies to kill and destroy you. They're drawing, the white enslavers, white society was drawing a connection between their abuse of enslaved people, their use of terror against enslaved people to try to control them, and the possibility of insurrection. As one put it, the cup of wrath is almost full. So enslavers heeded that warning. They watched for um, signs that enslaved people were about to rise and they established policing apparatuses organized around the possibility of insurrection. The first policing forces in the colonies that would become part of the United States were meant to control enslaved people to prevent insurrection. The very wellspring of slave law was actually the fear of enslavers. And their hypervigilance prompted them to interpret things as sinister whenever they caught a glimpse of slave life and overheard their conversations. When they saw people gathering, as I'm showing you in the image here, they wondered what they were talking about. And when they overheard things, they sometimes misunderstood them and thought they overheard a plan for rebellion and hauled people before the court and co uh, interrogated them and used torture to coerce them into telling them what they wanted to hear. So what I'm describing is this, a phenomenon called the slave conspiracy scare. Um, this conspiracy scare phenomenon emerged from a combination of enslaved people's traumatic experience of terror and enslavers' awareness of their culpability and exposure to the people whom they exploited. On at least 96 documented occasions before 1790, if I go back to this map, it'll give you a sense of how many we're talking about. On at least 96 occasions before the Haitian Revolution, uh, the um, colonists, the white colonists of the British colonies discovered evidence of a slave conspiracy just in time, they thought, to avert the uprising. Now, many of the answers to why this happened um, that I give in the book are related to the investigation of the plot rather than the alleged plot itself. The key to explaining what happened here is to focus on the relationship between powerful interrogators or judges and disempowered enslaved people who appeared before the court. These were asymmetrical exchanges. The um, investigators found it imperative to try to arrive at accurate details, but they couldn't help themselves from using torture and from bringing the whole coercive structure of racial chattel slavery with them into the courtroom um, to heavily influence what informants were saying. Um, there were um, 
considerations of life and death in the balance for accused conspirators. So they had some very difficult choices to make. Most insisted they were innocent or they kept silent, which often resulted in their conviction. A few took the opportunity to name personal enemies as conspirators who could be arrested. But the devastating handful of suspects who saved themselves by making themselves indispensable to the inquiry named names. They told investigators what they wanted to hear about decoy fires and um, white agents who infiltrated society. And they gave them information that brought results for the inquiry and ultimately reinforced that system of slavery. This was a system or a situation that encouraged exaggeration about threats that played on slaveholders' worst fears. And the result became what we now have as documentation of these alleged conspiracies. Suspects in jail lost, as they were awaiting trial and as they were being investigated, they lost access to networks of family, friends, and patrons, including masters who could have supported them. Their sources of power were actually now lodged in the court procedures itself in offering investigators the right information and currying favor with them. So a handful of suspects saved themselves by becoming informants, by providing evidence against jailed slaves and naming new suspects in exchange for promises of pardons and monetary reward and even freedom. Um, one man lamented in jail, he was overheard to say that fellows to save their own lives would say anything against him. And he was right. Let me give you an example um, as um, an, an illustration to conclude this. This will bring together a few threads of the book, uh, including that the, there's a Caribbean connection to North America, including that jails incubated false information and that enslaved people understood aspects of this witch hunt uh, and tried to manipulate it to save themselves and had few choices and made some harrowing decisions. There was a man named Bill in Antigua uh, in the Eastern Caribbean in 1736 when there was a conspiracy investigation that involved exploding um, a, a diversionary a, a building as part of a diversion and then conquering the colony in, in a familiar way that, that, that we're familiar with us now. At this early stage of the inquiry, the judges lacked information, so they ramped up their coercive techniques, and um, Bill agreed to turn King's evidence immediately before his sentencing. He would have uh, been forced, uh, when he was sentenced to death, he would have been forced to hang from an iron cage uh, and um, die of starvation and thirst and exposure. But he agreed to, to turn King's evidence to save himself. He gave up 50 names of acquaintances who he knew from those gatherings, like the one I showed you earlier. According to the partial trial records, he also served as a witness against 14 convicted suspects. He directly brought the um, death and banishment of those 14 people. As a reward, in exchange for his information, he received a pardon and transportation out of Antigua, where he realized everyone was going to hate him and um, would threaten his life. And he went to New York. He was transported to New York. He was still enslaved. Um, he lost um, his community, Antigua, but he also gained protection from the grieving families in Antigua who blamed him for what happened. In New York, a few years later, in 1741, a new um, conspiracy scare was um, unfolded, a new investigation, those 13 fires I mentioned earlier, and Bill was arrested because someone remembered that he had a little bit of reputation coming from Antigua. He was arrested and he ended up in jail. And he found a fellow prisoner in jail, Pedro, and explained to Pedro that he, quote, understood these affairs very well. And that, quote, unless he did confess and bring in two or three he would either be hanged or burnt, burnt at the stake. He prompted Pedro with some likely names as the proper ones to be accused. And they discussed that it was best to mention fire because that would quote, make the judges believe him, the decoy fire, especially in New York where those 13 fires were occurring. This kind of jailhouse collaboration was common in these situations. And um, so Bill went to court he confessed, he drew on his reliable trope 
that had worked in, in Antigua. In his case, he mentioned that there was an outside instigator who came in to organize the slaves in New York. He said he'd taken the oath of that instigator and um, said he was going to burn and destroy whatever they could in this insurrection. Um, he didn't receive the pardon that he hoped. He was burned at the stake because he had this reputation from Antigua. At the stake, he tried again to save himself by naming two white soldiers, identifying them as Catholics and hinting that other soldiers were also involved. So trying to um, build up the stakes and the urgency here, saying that not even the soldiers could be relied on. He also named nine more enslaved men as conspirators, he accused them. The only person he protected was Pedro, his collaborator in jail. What he didn't realize was that this one significant reason that he was sent to the stake in the first place is that his confidant, Pedro, had betrayed him. Again, something common in these situations. Pedro, through his assistance to the investigators, had won his himself pardon and release um, because he revealed that Bill had coached him in jail and that information um, saved his own life. So Bill died at the stake, Pedro was released, and everyone here was making harrowing decisions as they used what they learned from one conspiracy scare and applied it to survive another. So what I hope I've showed you here today, given you a taste of, is that these conspiracy investigations, to conclude, were not clear windows through which enslavers could look out onto enslaved people's politics. They were more like warped glass or the bubbled glass of the, an 18th century window pane that distorted white people's views of enslaved life and partially obscured it with reflections of their own fear. If we bring those distortions more clearly into focus, we can see that they um, have disguised significant dynamics of fear for enslaved people. We can also see that they have naturalized through enslavers fear and through their power in creating the archive by writing the records, many embellishments and racialized stereotypes of the threat of insurgent violence from the perspective of white people. And our clearer vision shows us that enslavers had less confidence in their mastery than they claimed, articulating their perceived vulnerabilities. And it gives us a better understanding of enslaved people's human experiences of terror and trauma and their vast array of responses to it, not just insurrection. Violence's less visible counterpart is fear. And it influenced a person's perception of the realm of possibility. This shaped decisions, it inspired actions, it, it governed social relations, and at the same time, a person with some awareness of others' fear, like Bill had, is it to exercise power and attempt to oppress someone or subvert them or just to survive. Uh, and now I'd uh, really love to take any questions that um, you have submitted through the Q&A feature in Zoom. Great, thank you so much, Jason. Uh, maybe if you want to take your slides down, uh, we can pull them up if there are any questions related to it. Thank you. Uh, so we've got a, a good number of questions coming in and folks uh, use the Q&A button to go ahead and type in any that come to mind as we're talking. Um, really, really powerful uh, scholarship that you shared with us today. I wonder if you might just to start us off, take us back in the research process, take us back to the beginning. and. You know, where was the, mo did you come into this project with a kernel of an idea about the differences between the intended and the actual and the fear that undergirded it? Or was there a moment where it sort of came together for you? Uh, I was not looking for this project. I was, I was always very interested in the lived experiences of enslaved people and how they formed communities. And one of the source bases that historians turn to in that situation is trial records. Um, so uh, the people who do not write diaries for themselves or write letters, the way we hear their words is we see, as we wait for them to commit crimes uh, or be accused of that, and then they appear in a legal setting and then there are records taken of them. And 
um, so I was using trial records just to get them a sense of what their daily lives were like. And I was canvassing those and I started to notice this strange pattern. And it was that decoy fire. It was that in trials of these uh, alleged conspiracies, these potential rebellions, several people in different places and different times said strikingly similar things about the decoy fire. And I said, as a historian, I said, I know that that's very unusual and strange because we're talking about a 150 year span of time. We're talking about geography from um, New York all the way down to Barbados. Things should not be that consistent. There are different histories influencing those different places. And so I said, okay, um, there's a new question for me. And I set out to find that answer. That's great. Uh, I think that ties nicely into a question from Francis Hober about the, your ability to sort of under, un, unpack the social, I think you've, you've done a nice job unpacking the intellectual origins, perhaps or the cultural origins. Um, what about the maybe social or psychological origins of these common imaginings? I'm curious if you ever wanted to go John Demos, right? And think about uh, entertaining Satan, if there's a, if there, if that becomes a component or maybe where you draw your lines uh, as a historian. Um, well, certainly there there's are parallels to witchcraft. So you could use an anthropological approach to understand um, what's happening here. And, and um, that is a big component in the book. I'm trying to, um, so, so by social origins, I, I'm not sure if you mean class tensions or uh, associational um, um, origins that would happen with these networks of people who know each other and accuse each other. But um, certainly the associational networks um, are very common to um, the large witchcraft trials, the witch hunts of Central Europe, not so much New England, except for the case of Salem, but in Central Europe, um, that, that people would accuse acquaintances who are far out uh, in their chains of acquaintanceships so that the uh, investigation would move away from family and loved ones. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, class conflict, um, certainly, uh, I, I think the examples of actual slave revolts and the tensions, the daily tensions between masters and slaves or enslavers and enslaved um, are a social origin of this phenomenon. What if we, what if we probe it a little from the gender angle, uh, both the role of enslaved women in the actual insurrections, but also the, the specter of them perhaps in the, um, in the plots. And then on the other side, um, in this sort of social inversion, is there a role for the white woman either as sort of victim or as, um, you know, it, do rich widows maybe ever appear as someone who's going to be, you know, sort of replaced in these kind of, these made up lists? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, so, to take the last part, the role expected for white women, it's sometimes as um, victims of massacre, uh, death, but sometimes it's a form of kind of sexual captivity or sexual slavery, which mirrors the social history of slavery itself, that um, enslaved women were kept in that, uh, they were threatened by that daily. Um, uh, and so a lot of the violence that enslavers imagined would happen to them in retribution was just a mirror image of what they were doing to the enslaved. Um, could, could you remind me of the first part of your question? So thinking about the role, a lot of the examples I feel like you gave today were about enslaved men right. um, leading revolts or uh, being, being sort of prosecuted perhaps as the, the primary culprits, um, both what is your research, you know, looking at these 96 cases, what is it revealed about the place of the enslaved woman um, in these? Yeah, so the white observers at the time did not want to see enslaved women as participants in this. They, they tended to downplay that a lot. Um, they do show up sometimes as people who would have been called conspirators, who would have taken up arms, who would have become rebels. Um, but frequently white people imagine that that's a male activity. Uh, we have evidence to the contrary in real revolts, um, but this was the imagination. The, um, the true role of women, of enslaved women, was um, the, um, in the social networks 
on Saturday nights and Sundays that created the um, community. And when I use the word community, I don't mean it was all harmonious, but created um, the dense network of connections and relationships between people who liked each other, didn't like each other. Okay. They, they got together on Saturday nights and Sundays. And where do they gather? It was at women's houses. Frequently, men were married um, to someone, to a woman who was on a different plantation. These were called abroad marriages. Um, and uh, his wife on that other plantation would host people on his behalf at her house or their house on, on her plantation on where she was enslaved. And the women did a lot of the labor of, of having the male acquaintances come together and have a feast um, or, or host the dance. And these sites of social activity became places where acquaintances got to know each other. So they had people who they could accuse when they found themselves in dire straits and had to think of you know, names to name. Um, and also those were places that enslavers looked at and they said, huh, there was a gathering. What were people talking about there? They would ask about what conversations were transpiring. They didn't ask what the women were doing, but the women were the reason that those gatherings were able to exist. The men were the ones who uh, ended up in jail for it. That's fascinating. Um, we have a question here from David Kirikoff. Uh, and this, I think, get, goes maybe to the temporal length of your study. Um, says, you know, he, he points out that the 1749 plan that you open with sounds a lot like Gabriel's game plan in 1800. Um, and he assumed, I think, that we get from the literature that Gabriel was basing his plan on the Haitian burning uh, of Lacap. Uh, is it possible that the memories of the earlier plan might have been part of that mental world? I mean, what, what does Haiti sort of do uh, to, to insurrections uh, and, and maybe conspiracy scares as well? Mm, that's a great question. Um, it's, there's a kind of a complicated answer. And so one version of the answer is the 19th century conspiracies like Gabriel's, upri uh, G Gabriel's conspiracy in 1800, Denmark Vesey in 1822, um, they actually come out of a longer tradition that the, is documented in the book from, uh, from before Haiti. Um, and so the roots kind of bypass Haiti in, in one way. In a different sense, though, Haiti changes everything because Haiti was a rebellion that grew so large that it became a war for independence um, and a war to end slavery. Um, and um, that proved to onlookers that the world turned upside down that they feared was possible. This was the time when it actually happened. Um, now it didn't look like they exactly what they had feared, but the result was something that they were afraid of. So it amped up those concerns. And yeah, it, it, um, it led to a lot more conspiracy scares afterward. And they were shifted slightly to resemble more things from Haiti. So what people were reading about in the news about Haiti worked its way into some of these later conspiracy scares. This, I'm, really, I'm really struck by the idea of sort of fear that's undergirding mm. this. And I'm curious, is fear a constant? Is fear cyclical? Is fear sustainable? I mean, what happens in a society that almost keeps ramping up its fear? Um, does this fuel the American Revolution in a way? Or, you know, can you connect this maybe to Dunmore and what he's sort of sensing? Um, or is there a natural time when it just has to come down? You know, that, uh, mm. I don't know, maybe I'm asking if, if insurrections are cathartic, you know, that the, the white society blows off its steam. Um, yeah, so these, um, so I've, charted this, I'm sharing my screen now, showing you how frequent these scares were. And you see the American, oh, it, it appears my, um, my graphic isn't perfect, but um, if you could see the American Revolution period, it was a peak of these conspiracy scares. And each of these peaks actually corresponds with certain factors in the environment like war, um, because the, it was believed the slaves would partner up with the invading force and that spies from the invading force would organize the slaves to do that. Um, also with big demographic changes, big economic changes. So I wouldn't say fear was cyclical in, its, in a natural sense you know, to itself within the system of slavery. I think it helps to historicize looking at 
this phenomenon by saying, what else was happening in the context around slavery? But let's look at slavery as part of the larger colonial system. And when you do that, um, these graphs make a lot more sense. You know, you see the first peak and seven big one in 1735 um, to 44, that's during the War of Jenkins Ear. There's another one during the war, the, the Seven Years' War. And then if my graphics weren't <laughs> uh, misbehaving, you would see the revolution um, as a huge war that, um, yes, uh, these fears fueled the American Revolution. When Lord Dunmore offered the possibility of freedom on you know, very strict terms of you know, have to be a certain person and do a certain thing, you know, take up arms against um, the rebels, um, that touched a sensitive nerve. Uh, it, it wasn't just messing with the system of slavery in the minds of people, especially in the Southern colonies. It was tapping into this long history of outside invaders supposedly partnering up with slaves and organizing conspiracies. And so there were investigations in which loyalists were accused of organizing the slaves, in which a British governor was accused of doing that, and that Native Americans would be brought into it too. I wonder, uh, as a sort of final question, I think your department chair must love that you can teach the history of conspiracy scares. I wonder if you might think a little bit or share with us how you sort of connect this work with your larger teaching in courses like that. And, and what, do our, what do our undergraduates respond to? Oh, that's interesting. I'm teaching a course on conspiracy theories right now for the first time this semester. And um, I'm still figuring out what my students are responding to. I'm finding that there is still a lot of confusion about what's real and what's not real out there. Um, and um, I, I think, you know, a, a major thesis of that course is that conspiracy theories are more believable when they resemble reality. They have elements of reality. And I think that's what's so confusing. I see it, I see it with my students as they're trying to find their way through this. And I'm sure this is happening in the general public too. But when there are elements or kernels of truth, it makes things it makes the larger exaggerations seem more likely. Also, if something fits into one's existing worldview and, and kind of in that theory kind of supports assumptions that you have. So for example, in, in my book, I, um, it's the assumption that slaves cannot lead themselves supposedly. That's what white people believe at the time. Um, then a conspiracy theory about spies, outside agents, um, invasion forces, that's more appealing because it fits with what you already, you know, believe is inherent to the people that you're talking about. Um, and, uh, and so I, I do see that kind of same logic um, today at work. Um, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a challenge to teach this course and I, I really like it, um, but it does seem more imperative now. I would think that absolutely feels pretty imperative these days. So thank you so much for doing it. Um, if we didn't get to your question today, I uh, will be we'll be downloading these and sharing them with Jason. Uh, so don't don't feel like you have uh, missed out. We of course we have recorded this as well, and it will probably go up on the APS website uh, in probably in the next week or so. Uh, I would encourage you to check back, uh, share this with your students, share this with your friends. It's been a wonderful talk today. Um, I want to just give folks a little teaser. Uh, Jason, as he mentioned, had been a fellow of the David Library. We are continuing that tradition. We will have uh, four fellowships, uh, short-term fellowships uh, that will be off uh, available. Uh, you can come back to the American Philosophical Society website. They will be due in March of 2021. Uh, as you know, it's a, it's a difficult time to get into archives right now. I think Jason, you probably lucked out in doing your work when you did and uh, being able to get to places. I also wanna share that uh, we are very excited and we'll soon be uh, mentioning uh, a new postdoc and a new pre-doc that will be offered uh, at the APS. We very much recognize the precarity of the job market, uh, the need uh, that faculty have uh, to finish their dissertation, to transform their dissertations into books. Uh, so we will be looking forward to announcing those in a few weeks. Uh, so if you're out there and you're looking to come do work in the great David Center collections at the American Philosophical Society, there will be new opportunities for you in 21, 22. Uh, so please, everyone at home, join me in thanking Jason for a fantastic talk today. Uh, and we look forward to seeing everyone at the next APS virtual discussion. Thanks for the great questions.